Well, my friends, and welcome to our fourth week of our study of John, the Gospel of Light and Life that we've been working through. And so this is our next to last week, and I'll talk about that more in a minute. But if you've not done so before we launch into our lesson, I invite you to open your Bibles. We're going to kind of do just a quick glance at uh, chapters 11 and 12 as we finished with chapter 10 last week. And then we're going to move on into what will be the bulk of our uh, lesson for today, the Farewell Discourse. So if you want to pause the tape and get your um, video, but well, it's old school set to say tape, isn't it? But if you want to get your Bibles handy, it might be nice to have them. And then you can pause as we move through this and mark certain scriptures if you desire to do so. Like I said, we're going to be calling this the Farewell Discourse, which is the bulk of chapters 13 through 17. But before we get there, we want to look at verses uh, chapters 11 and 12, because we did not really hit upon those last week. And I think that will help us as we move forward into our next um, uh, section there. So as we move on into um, this, this passages from um, into John 11, I were help you to recall that last week when we completed chapter 10, I think I made this statement to you that this was the conclusion of Jesus' ministry, meaning that he is at the end of um, all that he has come to do in his three years of ministry. I also remind you that John, unlike the other synoptic gospels, has this uh, cumulative look at Jesus' ministry, whereas the other gospels more or less focus upon Jesus last year with interspersing stories of things that maybe have happened throughout the three years. But John is intentional about kind of doing a summative of all the years that Jesus spent together. And so he's kind of divided it uh, theologically uh, into parts. And then we move into a transition period before we get to the trial, crucifixion, and resurrection uh, type of the story. So he's at this conclusion, and he's going to do one more miraculous thing. Uh, like I said, this serves as these two chapters serve as a transition piece between the end of ministry and uh, what he will say to the disciples and ultimately to those of us who would follow them before he goes on to his crucifixion story. In chapter 11, what we see is the very last sign. Remember, there were seven signs and seven I am statements in the Gospel of John. And this is the last sign. And what it is, is going to be a raising of Lazarus from the dead. And you remember that story of Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus. We hear in the other synoptic gospels of the close friendship that they shared, that Jesus often found himself in their home for a meal or a teaching or just resting among friends. So you see this rich relationship and we hear the story that he's been summoned because Lazarus is you know, dying, and before he gets there, he is dead. And so there's the story that comes then of Jesus arriving, of Jesus meeting uh, the, the sisters, of, of them asking why didn't he come sooner if he had been there, he, that he would surely have lived. But that's not the point of the story. The point of the story is to show the omnipotent power of God that, that even death cannot conquer the life that God has created. And so he brings that back uh, brings Lazarus back to life. But the problem with it in terms of those who are watching the story is they have trouble accepting that Jesus has such power. Now, you know, we would see that story and think this is someone who's got it all. I really want to follow them and I want to listen to everything they have to say. But as people in power and the threat of losing that power uh, are no different today than they were then, we see them being challenged, that we see them being fearful that Jesus is demonstrating such power to them. And so if you have your Bibles open and can look in um, chapter 11, we're going to look at verse um, um, 45. We're going to start there. And it says, therefore, many of the Jews who come to visit Mary of Mary and Martha had seen what Jesus did, and they put their faith in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. And then the chief priest and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. Now we look at this story and kind of marvel. Seriously? Did you not celebrate? Did you not rejoice that Lazarus had been brought back from the dead? No, they're going to call a meeting because this is making them uneasy. They don't really get this Jesus fellow. And then they said amongst themselves, what are we accomplishing? 
here is a man performing many miraculous signs, so at least they're recognizing Jesus and what he is doing. But if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and then the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Instead of believing Jesus was who he said he was as the son of God, they just simply believed that he was someone who could do some miracles that they could not explain. And it was going to cause a great divide within the Jewish people. And then if they're divided, then they're going to come in because Rome has let them just kind of go about their own thing. And they're going to take away our positions here as head of the faith. And we will lose our nation of Judaism. So, you know, what they want to keep, they cannot see keeping it under Jesus. They're missing the whole point because they do not believe in the divinity of Jesus. They simply believe that he's someone who has done some miraculous things that they're going to attempt to explain away. But they're more concerned about what does it do to us in this present moment, in this present place. Now, unknown to what he was actually saying, Caiaphas, who was the chief priest, actually makes this remark. He said, you know nothing at all. It is better that one for one man to die than for the whole for the people than for one whole nation to perish. And so basically he's saying, well, we've got to get rid of this one man. Otherwise, we're all going to be goners. But isn't it ironic, maybe not so, that in that one death, a whole nation of people would ultimately be saved, a whole nation of people that goes beyond just the Jewish people, but to include all people who have the opportunity to be saved by this Jesus they had snippets, but they lost so much in not understanding who he was. And so we see what we still see here is the building of the story toward a divisiveness against Jesus, uh, you know, that they had to put an end because he was appearing to be too powerful and the people might begin to follow them. And then everything that they know of would come to an end. So that's in chapter 11. And so it will ultimately show that Jesus has more power than they because he can uh, conquer even death. And Lazarus is a symbolic story to say, you might kill, but you will not conquer. And so there is that part of that story. So when we move from chapter 11 into the first part of chapter 12, what we're going to see is this link between the discussion to kill Jesus and its linkage to the story of the Passover. So it says that six days before the Passover, Jesus arrives in Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So it's this linking piece of the story that's setting the stage of what's going to happen during the Passover week before we get to the Passion Week, if you will, of Jesus. And so the interesting link between this then is this whole story about a foot washing. Now, you will recall that in the food washing story, uh, they're gathered together. Uh, they're uh, they're uh, at Martha's house. Uh, this is where she's gone. She's gone to this. He's gone to the town of Bethany. He's at Martha's house. And Mary takes this nard, if you will, it's in an expensive uh, product, and she pours it upon Jesus' feet. And so we see this stage being set because what we'll do, it'll introduce for, uh, to us who Judas is, but we will see that the one who is a follower of Jesus, really going out into ministry with him and has been with him for these three years, misses what the woman who is simply his friend will uh, show to him. And so as he pours it out, Judas makes the comment, well, could this not have been sold and given to the poor? But Jesus is going to introduce to them the concept of servanthood. This is going to be you know, that you give up so that others might be served. And in doing this and surrendering him, she's acknowledging that he is the one that's going to teach us from that. And he's the one that's going to lay down his life so that others might be freed. And the follower of Jesus, Judas Iscariot, misses the point. He wants to raise some other link to that. And then when we come through uh, passages from 12, 12 through 50, what we're going to read within that is Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, his explanation to the people as to why he must die, 
we're going to see that some of the people were convinced and we're going to see others that are not going to be so convinced. And, you know, and they will, it will begin, you know, like even after Jesus had done all these miraculous signs in their presence, they still would not believe him. Meaning here, mostly the religious leaders of the community, no matter what he did, they still saw him as a threat, not as someone working with them in ministry. And then ultimately, in this uh, closing of this 12th chapter, Jesus will explain his purpose for being here, for dying, and kind of throw out, if you will, the gauntlet that says, then you have a choice whether you choose to believe or to not believe. So as we move into the farewell discourse, into these chapters 13 through 17, just as a little preamble to that, when we look at the comparing the gospel stories together, how much of them have anything to say about that last supper, we recognize that Matthew and Mark really have very little to say about it. We hear some institution language, which means the words of institution for communion. This is my body that is broken for you. Do so in remembrance of me. This is my blood poured out for you. Do so in remembrance of me. That language that we say in our Holy Communion or Eucharist service, we see hear some of that. But in the Gospel of Luke, we hear it in about 25 verses. And so you see the disparity between how they each report that out. For the John, he doesn't spend a lot of time talking about water, wine, and baptism because he's already done that in these last chapters or before these last chapters. Instead, but John is going to devote 25% of the entire gospel really speaking about this. Uh, what does it all mean? What is baptism, water, wine, bread? What does it all mean? And he's going to pull that all together and what will make up about 25% of his whole gospel in the chapters 13 through 17. He's going to hit on these things in, in various and different ways and in various and different discussions as he moves forward. John prepares the God disciples for what is to come. He's trying to explain to them things that are happening, what the meaning is, what is going to happen to him, and why it must happen. And so what he's doing is we can relate to that in some ways, because we as human beings, whether we know it or not and want to admit it or not, we think about, and in some ways, we pr prepare for our time of demise. Otherwise, why do we have life insurance policies and living wills? Uh, 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 we give power, medical power of attorney to people. We do these things that speak to, you know, our last will and testament that we recognize, we all recognize there will come a time where we no longer walk the earth. And so what we begin to do is we begin to enter that into that conversation. Sometimes it's through legal means, such as I just spoke, but it can also be through such things as this was your great grandfather's and I'm going to, when I die, I'm going to give it to you and I want you to keep it and give it to your children. We're preparing a legacy, something that we're going to leave behind. And we will be telling people things that we want to get out in case we forget to tell them. You know, we might say even words of never forget that I love you, no matter how, you know, um, Many times you may hear it, I don't ever want you to forget that I love you. I don't ever want you to forget. And we give them these things. And it can be from the mundane to this is where I keep all the passwords. So if something happens to me, you know where they are. To the very uh, emotional, connected pieces of, you know, that, you know, we will always be a part of one another in this earth and beyond this earth. That we have, will have transformed each other. We will have uh, challenged each other. We will have taught each other. We will have done these great things together and we will have created memories together. And so this is how, what, really what Jesus is doing with his people. These are his closest people on earth. And he knows that to leave is going to be difficult for them, just as we know that. We know that there are people who love us that if we were not here anymore would grieve greatly for our being gone. And so he's trying to prepare their hearts to accept the fact that his days upon earth are not many more. And so we think about that, that he's teaching them. And we read this as upbeat and assuring and whatever. But I want, if you can, to kind of get your head into the idea of Really, what do you think the mood was of that? These, this is the man, think of this, this is the man for whom 
they had walked away from their families, from their careers, from the places that they lived to follow him for these past three years. And suddenly he says to them, by the way, I'm going to have to die. I'm not going to be with you. And it would be like, what? Well, we don't even know how to go on without you. We, we're not ready. You haven't taught us everything yet. We don't know where this is supposed to go, what the end of this story is supposed to look like. What are we supposed to do? And so imagine their mood. And I'm sure it's all across the gamut from just sheer grief of the, and the expectation of loss to this uncertainty of, I don't know what to do next. And I'm not ready this feeling of inadequacy that comes to them, I'm not yet ready. And it's the very same feelings that we feel when those who are dear to us are passing on. Well, as we move into chapter 13, then he's going to speak to several of these issues that probably has them in a tither, to put it mildly, as they're listening to him. And John's gospel, whereas when he speaks of the Last Supper, or what uh, um, people are to do, he doesn't use it in what we would call explicit language. Instead, he teaches with explicit, with explicit acts. What was it that Jesus did? And in so doing, taught us to do the same thing. That we're to be modeling what he did. And to do all those things with a sense of humility. And so when we come into this, first story, we understand what he's talking about here, because the first thing that he does is wash the disciples' feet. He's walked into a home. Normally, there's a servant there who washes people's feet. They're dusty. They're dirty. They, you know, wear sandals, sometimes nothing at all, but their feet walking through the towns are very nasty. Uh, not only are they sit dust and dirt, but remember, there's not sanitation issues like we have in this thing. So you just never know. It could be animal feces as they've meandered about or human uh, uh, excrement. There's all kinds of things that are present. And so to come in to wash your feet was just a simple practice that they always did. And it would be up to someone, the lowliest servant, because it was kind of nasty work to bend down and wash someone else's feet. And this is the job that Jesus chose to do. He looks around, recognizes that people haven't had their feet washed. He gets up, he lays aside his robe, and he goes forward to wash their feet. Now, it's interesting that in the Gospel of Luke, there is this same story. But in this Gospel of Luke, it is, uh, it's wrapped up in another story. And that's the argument by two of the disciples as to who is going to be the greatest when their time comes to go to heaven. And so I think, like I said, you remember the Luke and Matthew and Mark, and they kind of give these stories kind of interspersed that happen without really knowing, well, which of the years of Jesus' ministry did that happen? And so John places it here to insinuate to us that this story, that that must have been that conversation that was happening when Jesus was washing their feet. And so can you imagine their embarrassment? They're sitting there talking about <clears throat> who's the greatest can, that can be seated upon his right hand. And Jesus quietly gets up and he goes over, he takes a, a pan and washes their feet. Can you imagine how ashamed they probably were that if you want to be great, this is what it looks like. It looks like doing the nastiest job in a household. It looks like bowing down before someone else. It looks like setting aside my robe, the thing that defines who I am. And that's going to equate to Jesus literally laying, uh, putting his life aside. In fact, the same language occurs if you read the original script within that. So he's laying aside his robe literally and figuratively where he's going to be laying aside his life. And that is truly what service looks like. And so what Jesus is showing to the people here is that there's a fundamental principle of the Christian faith, and that is that you're to serve others. You are to set yourself aside always on behalf of someone else. And so what that comes with this instruction, love one another as you've been loved. So I've showed you that I'm willing to go to any depths to you. I'm willing to bow to you. I'm willing to clean for you. I'm willing to do whatever it takes so that I can sure, so surely you will see the great love that you have for me. And I must say, we still respond to that today. You know, I always think of motherhood and in motherhood, you're called upon to 
then nurture that sick child that's throwing up or is has other things coming out of their body and you clean it and you soothe them and you hold them because you love them. You have just this great outpouring of love and you do anything to make things better for them. And we see that oftentimes in the marital you know, circles as well as you go into nursing homes or into people's homes and see them lovingly care through all the difficult days of people who are in declining health love and see them tenderly taking care of them. And they're saying they're loving their other one as they have been loved by them if the situation were reversed. So that's what Jesus is modeling for the people here. And so in a, in a nutshell, and it's this question, and maybe it's in your notes that you cling onto and reflect upon in the coming weeks, but what is it that you're focusing on? See, our culture kind of teaches us that to be a servant is not the ideal profession, that you who act weak or who bow or who set aside for somebody else are not in a position of power and leadership, and that's what our culture honors. And so within this simple act of foot washing, there's a complex reminder that, you know, that we're not to be pursuing those things. We're pursuing humility. That are we humbly serving others outside um, and, and within our daily walk of life. We move from that into Jesus showing his disciples how they are to be to kind of give them then some wonderful comfort and advice and an advocate that's always going to be there. And ultimately telling them, are you going to trust me when whatever comes and whatever happens? And he begins often, we, we refer to these as the words of assurance. Uh, we also refer to them in a funeral as a eulogy within our eulogy giving. And it's almost like he's given his own eulogy. And I love these opening verses, and I love hearing them at every funeral. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and also in me. In my father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go and prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you with me. And there you will be with me. Because where I am going, you will be too. And you know the place that I am going love this. It's just like when it's all stripped away, do you still trust? Do you still believe? And Jesus is giving all people the assurance of this place. The disciples then and the disciples to come. He said, what I've told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will make a room for you there. Jesus is speaking to the people in a very patriarchal language. Remember, Jewish people lived in communities together the patriarch, the oldest of the clan who had the children, then his, or, and then the, the children would grow up and marry and their wives would come in and then they would have children. It was this ever expanding place that you, you kept getting another room, you kept finding a place and even the servants and the animals and everything under that patriarchal leadership abided there. And when it got too big, as, as such as we saw in the calling of Abraham and his nephew Lot, when it got too big, Lot became the patriarch of his group, and Abram went off with, with this other, you know, group. And so, but the, the idea here is that the head of the household, God, has a place for you, and he's going to always have a place, and Jesus is going, and I'm going to go get your room ready for you. And when I've told you I'm going to do that, if I'm not going to come back and take you to me. So he's saying this is a temporary separation. This is a temporary departure there's still going to be a place for you in the end of that. So it's these words of assurance. And then he says, but in the meantime, until you come to that place, I'm going to send something else to give you comfort here upon earth. Now, in the other gospels, it is known as uh, pneuma, which means breath. We call it the Holy Spirit. I remember we used to call it the Holy Ghost. And I guess because of all the connotations of ghost and spirit, uh, it, it seemed not true or not real. But in the Gospel of John, he is the only one that causes it, calls it the paraclete. And the word paraclete has several meanings, but they all kind of come around the same theme. An advocate, a counselor, a comforter, a helper, or an encourager. And, and when you read throughout these passages, Jesus speaking about the advocate, 
it may take on any one or all of these roles depending upon the circumstance. So he says that, you know, while you're waiting to come and join me in this room I'm preparing for you, I'm also going to be with you through this means, through the Holy Spirit, between that feeling, that presence of Christ within us. And so we're going to look at a prayer as we close today that's just this idea that no matter which direction we may go, Jesus is already there. He already goes before us and assures us of that. And the whole point of chapter 14 is to tell us that he will not and did not leave us alone when he ultimately left this earth. When we move on into chapter 15, we will get the final I am saying. So we've had the final sign in the raising of Lazarus. And we have the final I am statement, which I know you're familiar with, which is this one. I am the true vine and my father is the vineyard keeper. And so he goes on to tell us, all the disciples who will remain, that we are to stay connected to the father, the vineyard keeper. That just as he was the true vine, we stay connected to him because he's connected to the father. And he says that he has to remain in us and we must remain in him. That it's this giving and taking of relationship. He promises not to leave us, but in the same time, we need to promise that we're going to stay connected to him. Because he says, if you're not connected to me, you cannot bear the fruit by yourself. You will not have what it takes in order to be a fruit bearer. Well, we practice this, this means of staying connected through our prayer, our worship, our reading of scripture, and our serving his people throughout the world, doing his work. We also encourage one another by, and when we study together and we care for each other because, you know, it's hard for one vine to live alone out and produce much of anything. But when you put all the vines together and they produce fruit together, the work can be powerful and the work can be mighty. And so when we see, well, what is this fruit that we're to bear? He says, it's a, it's a dual thing. One, love one another. This is the commandment that of all the 10 that I've given you, let's add this one. This is the one that's most important. Love one another in the same way that I have loved you. For no one has greater love than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. Now, I used to always think that that meant I had to die in order to show the depth of my love for another. But what it means most often is simply a setting aside of self for others. When I was a young mother, I was a uh, working full time uh, and I had left my, my position to come and be a stay at home mom for a while. And it hit me one day uh, because I thought that that would be the best for our children. So in that moment, I set aside me I enjoyed my work. I enjoyed what I was doing. But I needed to set aside me for something more important than me. That was laying a grounding and a foundational work in these children for whom we had so long awaited. People lay down their lives all the time. People set aside their time to care for an elderly parent, uh, maybe to make a job change so that someone within their family has more opportunities that are really for the betterment of all. But it's, it's often means I've got to set myself aside in order to show my love of someone else, to really put aside what I most want at times for what will be the most help to someone else. Well, that's what Jesus is talking about. And so when I was thinking about this, you know, the, the thought occurred to me when we talk about what does it mean to bear fruit? What does it mean to truly be following and walking in the steps of Jesus? And I had this thought, and I think it's something that maybe we can lean into and lean upon as we kind of assess every day where we are. But if you were the only Christian on earth, what would others, and that word there should be think, what would others think about Jesus based upon you and your actions? In other words, would seeing who you are lead others to want to be a follower of Christ too. Pause and think about that. I've met people who profess to be Christians, and yet sometimes when I look at them, I see no Jesus in them. I see no Jesus in their ability or willingness to serve others or to give or to go the extra mile to love. So it always brings me up to 
if I were the only Christian on earth, would people see Jesus and want to follow him in me? No matter what time and culture, maybe that's a good place that we all pause and think about. So 15 is teaching us that to be a mature Christian, you cannot be in love with self. You have to be in love beyond self. And so it says he wants us to love the same way that he's loved us. And he loved us by setting self aside. And in that can sometimes come great satisfaction. You know, Jesus taught us and showed us that to love is to serve, to bless, to give life, and to want the best for others. And I've recorded in a devotion from this past week about Dr. Paul Brand, who uh, devoted his entire life to working with, uh, he was an orthopedic surgeon, a renowned orthopedic surgeon, who was really the first to discover that uh, what caused the, the damage to people's limbs in, in bodies in uh, leprosy was because of the decaying of the nerves. The nerves had lost their sensitivity. And in so doing, then the function of the tendons and, and the rest of the body could not work. And so he spent a lot of time working in nerve and tendon uh, work in order that there could be some restoration to the limbs and parts of the body that had been severely impacted by leprosy. And then he would go on to do that in terms of uh, the healing of people who's similarly diabetes takes limbs and things so forth because the nerves do not work and the vessels do not work in order to deliver blood supply. And so, you know, here he is world-renowned, highly trained, highly skilled, highly sought after, so that had been to some great places in the world to speak and to teach. And yet he found the depth of his calling by being in, in, in communities where the lepers live, those who had been cast out, particularly in India, that are, are known as the nobodies. That's where he wanted to be because it was within them that he said he most saw the image of Christ. I think of Henry Nowen, as many of you have read some of his work, and Henry was a great teacher. He was part of a, a fabulous institutions and famous institutions, a, a, a prolific writer and teacher and a sought after speaker. And yet Henry Nowen stepped aside from all the glory and acclaim that that brought him to go and to serve in the Ark Foundation, where he would be the day-to-day -day caretaker of a severely um, disabled young man, Adam, that he would tend to for years. And in that, he found the greatest calling of his life. And he saw that in that giving of himself, he most related to seeing the image of God within all creatures, all humans, all beings. So that was what he was talking about. Now, I'm not inferring that all of us have to surrender everything and walk away into those particular depths, but I think we've seen what it looks like. And do we even, you know, the first step is, we, do we even have a heart of empathy and care for those who have been cast aside? And maybe if we don't, that's the place that we start. But this is the transformation that Jesus was wanting us to make, that it wasn't about just what we knew in our head and even in our hearts, but what showed forth in our actions. And so there's a quote from Les Mis that says, to love another person is to see the face of God. And that's what we see within that. And Hamilton will write in his book this quote, love is the essential fruit of our faith. It doesn't matter how much you know how correct your theology is, how much money you give. If you don't practice love, you miss the mark. You are a vine that is unfruitful, the kind that Jesus said needs to be pruned and thrown into the fire. Thrown is misspelled there. In other words, to sum it all up, love's not just a feeling, but love is a lifestyle that really produces forth in action. So remember I said that John was explicit in that everything that Jesus did turned into an action. And he will go through these chapters and he'll say, uh, when, when you go to pray, this is what you should do. And he shows us what the action looks like. When you go to give, this is what it looks like. When you fast, this is what it should look like. He takes, you know, all these things and, and the when you illustrates to us that it's not, I might do that. It's understood that when you go to do this, the expectation that you are to do that. And then he goes on to tell us exactly what it's going to look like. 
And when you have money, what do you do with it? Where do you store it up? Do you store it up on earth? Because I'm telling you, that's not the best place. Instead, you need to be storing up your treasures upon heaven by doing these acts that I'm telling you to do. So this I am statement, I am the vine, and you've got to stay to the vine, is how we get our nourishment, our transformation, so that our lives become the lifestyle of Jesus. When we get to chapter 16, he returns to a theme that he started in 14, which is once again talking about his departure and what will be the effect upon the disciples that he leads behind. So it's interesting, though, that at this time, though, when he goes to talk, he's talking far less about assuring them and reminding them of, that it's all going to be okay, then kind of to impel them that just because I'm gone, this is what the future needs to look like. This is the stuff that I need you to, uh, to go on and do. And he's telling them that I have to leave and so that the work can continue. The work can continue through you because as long as people are focused on me and, and de dependent upon me to do everything and that I'm a challenge to the authorities in the land, nothing will happen as it should be. So that's why we always call ministry multiplying. We do our work to enable those behind us coming after us to do their work. And if, you know, if Jesus taught 12 and those 12 taught this many and those, uh, and it just continued what we might view as almost like a pyramid kind of thing, but it's incredible because in just a short amount of time, the disciples and the disciples of the disciples had reached the far ends of what they knew of as the earth at that time. So he says, I've got to leave so that you all can get on about your work and do what I've showed you how to do. And he says, again, I point to you that this is the work of the Holy Spirit, that he's going to be with you. I won't physically be here, but I will be with you because the Holy Spirit and I are one, and we will guide you through this process. Well, when he finishes this and these, these words that keep going, you've got a task before you, you've got a purpose and things that you want to do. What he does is he prays. And we call this his modeling of intercessory prayer because he's praying for the disciples and he's praying for those who will come after them. This is where we get included in Jesus' prayer for us. As we continue to be, as we pick up the, the, the light that someone has passed on to us in the relay and we keep carrying it forth so that we can turn around and hand it off to somebody else. Jesus is asking for the strength and the comfort that comes from that and probably of the many passages in the Bible, this is always my favorite. And he said, you know, he says, and now in this eternal life that you may know you're the only one true God in Jesus Christ whom you've sent. I brought you glory on earth by completing what you've asked me to do. And isn't that the prayer of every disciple? And then, he's, and then he goes, he prays for others. He says, I pray for those who will believe in me. And I pray for those who will believe in what they're telling them. He said, I pray for those who will believe in me through their message. That's what we get prayed for. He says, so whoever is teaching you the gospel message, I'm already praying for them. They were not even yet here. And this story reminds us, if you recall, when Moses had finally got the people out of the desert and they were heading toward that promised land, they'd made their tribal divisions and knew how it was all going to lay out when they got there and and G Moses is right there at the entrance into the promised land. But he's an old man by now. He will not be able to continue on. And he's already handed off the torch to Joshua. And he says, Joshua is the one that you're going to follow now. He's the one that's going to take the next leg of the journey and lead you on in. And that's what Jesus is doing with his people there. He's preparing to send them into leadership. And he wants them to model it and do it like they've done. And so this isn't the prayer of a dying man who's like, oh, I have nothing left. You know, uh, you know, life is handed me. I've got to go through this horrible uh, crucifixion. I've got to handle all of this. He's going through this, though, as a surrender. I'm stepping aside because I know when I step aside, people are going to be touched. It's going to multiply. The work is going to continue. And here some 2,000 years later, it still continues as we continue to try to touch lives, reaching far greater parts of the world 
than Jesus as one man walking the earth could ever have possibly done. He says, when I step aside, then you're going to be empowered and everyone coming after you will be empowered to go forth and do my work. It's this theological climax of this gospel, who God is, who God came to be here and who he will be in the, the time to come. But he's preparing us and, and we're still living within that is that, you know, we always say Christ was and is and is to come. And so we hear that and we're in that waiting for that is to come section. In the meantime, we pick up our torch and we continue to run the race before us. And so 17 will conclude this discussion with the disciples and we'll next week talk about then what does the passion story look like as found in the gospel of John. So when Jesus prays what we can get from this is that he modeled for us confidence. He asked God believing that he would receive what he asked for and he asked God knowing that there was going to be this future union with God in the time to come. And what we see in that is it shows us how faith and community work together to bring about God's kingdom here so that we don't go to church because it's all about just me and my relationship with God. What we see in Jesus' prayer for others is that, you know, yes, we've got this relationship, this union with God, but it is not complete unless it goes outward from there into community to be something else that's bigger than we are, that sets aside us for the work of, of God within the world. And so we see now that it's not, as I always look at the cross, it's not just the vertical beam of the cross, my relationship with God, but out of that relationship with God, we meet at the union where we then go be in relationship to teach others. And that's fully how the discipleships did their work and how the model spread. And it will remind us that we're part of an ongoing story God's story is not complete. Earth is not complete. We still have work to do. We're the next in the line, wherever we may be. And we're looking over our shoulders as to who's coming along behind us, but we're also looking up on whose shoulders we stand that have done the work so that we might continue on and we want to be, continue to hand that off. Well, that will conclude our lesson for today, except I want to go to prayer. But before I go there, uh, I think I'd sit on a syllabus that said something a little bit different. But next week, we are going to conclude this study on February the 14th. And we're going to be looking at the chapters 18 through 21, the summations, um, which has to do with uh, Jesus' arrest, trial, crucifixion, and then resurrection. And we want to do that because we want to start a Lent study two weeks from today for uh, Ash Wednesday is February the 17th. And I hope that you'll come and be a part of that. We have an online service that you may view um, at any time, uh, kind of once it comes out. <laughs> and also we'll have a drive through uh, imposition of ashes at noon and again uh, for one hour and a, again at six o'clock. Uh, both of those things will happen on the worship center side of the building. So if you didn't hear about that already, I hope that you mark your calendars to participate. And now as we close in prayer, uh, the prayer that I want us to close with is a, a prayer that really speaks to this Jesus being in and around, uh, behind and before. Um, it's an anonymous prayer. It's called a prayer of St. Patrick, but they really don't know who wrote it. And so this is included in your handout today, but we will close with that. I arise today through the strength of heaven, light of the sun, splendor of fire, speed of lightning, swiftness of the wind, depth of the sea, stability of the earth, and firmness of the rock. I arise today through God's strength to pilot me, God's might to uphold me, God's wisdom to guide me, God's eye to look before me, God's ear to hear me, God's word to speak for me, God's hand to guard me. God's way to lie before me, God's shield to protect me, God's host to save me afar and near, alone or in a multitude. Christ shield me today against wounding, Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right and Christ on my left. Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit up. Christ in the heart of everyone who thinks of me. Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me. Christ in the eye that sees me. 
Christ in the ear that hears me. I rise today through the mighty strength of the Lord of creation. I thank you for being with me. I pray all is going well. As always, if you have questions or comments, I look forward to hearing from you. And so until we meet again, I will bid you adieu and God's blessings upon you.